Good afternoon, Frederick. Good morning, everyone watching us, or good morning for some of you. Good evening, maybe, depending on where you are in the world. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Frederick Gomer, who's a partner at B2G Consulting based out of Singapore. He's going to talk to us about supply chain segmentation and agility. Before that, I'd like to remind everybody to uh, vote for the startup of the year. The contest is being organized by the Agora Club managers. The link is on the com in the comments section, as well as the video if you haven't watched it yet. Um, Frederick, could you just quickly introduce your company to us, please? Perfect. Thanks, Pierre, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. So I'm Frederick uh, Gomer, partner at uh, B2G Consulting, which is a consulting firm specializing in the supply chain optimization. So we have offices in, in France, for Europe, in Bahrain, for Middle East and Africa, and Singapore, where I'm uh, uh, dialing currently uh, from. So the, for some reasons, and uh, we are going to, uh, to discuss this in a minute, supply chain has been uh, at the epicenter of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So I'm extremely pleased uh, to be here today and share my views. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. So being that you're located in Asia and Southeast Asia, you went through the coronavirus crisis earlier than everybody else did, and you're not coming out earlier also. I'm really curious to get your take on what the state of mind is and what companies are working on to pull out of the uh, crisis, get back into good functioning mode, and what your recommendations would be as far as you know, achieving superior agility tomorrow, learning from what we've gone through, and having better functioning operations more more agile more ready for essentially just about anything what uh, what could you tell us about uh, the state of mind in uh, southeast asia right now yeah so as you may have noticed the uh, supply chains uh, have been under a lot of stress recently and uh, we have experienced as supply chain professionals uh, some situations which normally hardly occur a uh, shortage of basic products uh, such as uh, uh, toilet papers, uh, as you may know, just to give you an example. Uh, and those situations are unusual considering how well optimized our supply chains uh, are. So why? And uh, think of the supply chain as a vehicle, as a car. Uh, would you use a car, a sport car, to, to race in a bumpy, mountainous area? Uh, I guess the four wheels will be more, much more adapted. Uh, at the same time, uh, for those who are in an urban area in Paris, for example, you may not use a large car. Uh, to park, it will be just less convenient. So that's exactly the same situation when we uh, talk about the supply chain, specifically when COVID-19 has uh, uh, hit uh, us. We use a um, one-size-fits-all approach for any situations. And for example, the, the shoe size would be 42 for everyone. Uh, well, I'm 43, so too bad for me. But no, it's, it doesn't work. So most companies are under the, the, the misconception that there is one model for their supply chain, but that's not right in reality. So you may have to manage um, your global supply chains um, in, in, in different ways. For example, when you are in, uh, in markets which are well-developed, mature, and at the, the same time, you may manage uh, your supply chain in emerging growing markets with little maturity, you may have at the same time uh, complex products offering high-end products and along with low uh, value, high volume commodity products, even in different distribution uh, channels. And uh, you may uh, distribute directly to your consumers. You may go to wholesalers, distributors, e-commerce platforms, etc. So that's the, the typically the omni-channel situation. So within the same organization, you may have very different supply chains with very different dynamic and requirements. So the confusion comes from the fact that supply chain is, is supposed to be uniform, supposed to be integrated, but it's not. And it shouldn't be, in fact. Uh, so back to the car analogy, that, that's why on some cars you will have a, a mod, a sport mod or eco uh, mod, for example, uh, based on the driving uh, conditions. So the first step is to characterize the, the, the supply chain. It's, it's usually done against uh, two aspects. Uh, on one aspect, the uh, market demand maturity. So in short, it's how predictable is the demand? Is it erratic? Is it a highly uh, season, uh, uh, seasonal or very stable? And on the sub complexity, which will be the overall piece, complex 
is your manufacturing process and your, your supplier base. So I give you an example. If you are manufacturing, uh, if you are manufacturing or distributing make-to-order industrial components in France, which is a, a major market, uh, and at the same time in India, which might be a great market for you, uh, but with different the buying behaviors, then you need different uh, supply chain models. Uh, so you can imagine that in the same organization, you have, you may have engineer to order, configure to order, uh, make to stock products, spare parts sold across the globe uh, with different level of market maturity. So it, it can become a, a very important challenge in reality. So practically it means that uh, during uh, processes, planning processes such as SNOP, Sales and uh, Operations Planning Process, you have to segment the reviews according to the different supply chains that you uh, you may have. And for example, in the, the cosmetics industry, uh, this may mean that having um, a model for, for new acquired brands, for consumer uh, products, for luxury or professional products, um, they, they have to be different. So stay with me if, uh, here for a second. This does not mean that the segmentation has to follow your division, your business unit. Uh, there's a little bit of homework to be done here to characterize the products within your divisions or your brands or business units. So it's not just a one-on-one -on -one comparison. Now in the industrial uh, world, you, you may manufacture also assemble products and distribute spare parts uh, when, uh, when you need. Uh, to also segment uh, your the products that you sell on one side, the assemble one and the and the, the spare parts. And naturally, we have noticed, and specifically in Asia, that the the organizations have always adapted their practices on the ground to match the reality of their local situation. But this has never been in, institutionalized. Um, so. How do you really gain agility in this context? Uh, by segmenting the one-size-fits-all approach uh, into several supply chain models. So by model, I mean um, building a, a kind of matrix where you will have on one side the market conditions versus the supply complexity, uh, understanding how many different supply chains you may have and, and start to position them and to define how to source, which sourcing strategy is the most adapted, uh, where to manufacture, how to structure your manufacturing footprint, how to plan, uh, basically how to forecast at which granularity, at which level of, of confidence, and how to stock uh, your inventory, how to define the, the different inventory policies, uh, how to distribute, how should be configured your distribution network, and more importantly, how to measure the performance of each model. Uh, the KPIs that you, you may be uh, using uh, will be the same, but the expectations on the performance will be very different. And look at the, the forecast accuracy, for example. Uh, you may not have the same uh, forecast accuracy. So by doing that, you will be able to reach much higher performance levels. At each model will be optimized specifically uh, to its market uh, and supply conditions. Now, I've been uh, in Singapore for the past, over the past 11 years, and interestingly, in Asia, uh, the maturity of the supply chain is not as advanced as in Europe or in the uh, in the um, US, in North America, for example. But more and more organizations are looking at moving directly to this multimodal approach to manage the, the region here in Asia, which is um, extremely diverse uh, in maturity when you consider countries like Singapore and South Korea or Japan versus Thailand, Vietnam or, or Indonesia. So instead of focusing on building a strong regional supply chain capability as a whole, as you, you could just copy and pass from a, a European market, for example, a model, uh, they are looking at having, uh, yes, a regional governance, but with several models which are much more adapted to the reality of the different groups of markets. And that's very, and that's a very interesting trend that uh, I've, uh, I've seen uh, here. Uh, so I invite you to do this uh, this exercise, try to segment your supply chain, uh, redefine how it should be the, the performance drivers, and uh, let me know the results. And you. are you seeing that are you seeing that companies are uh, already doing that, or are you seeing that they're coming to a consulting firm such as yours to ask for guidance, and and then you provide that kind of advice, and they go, oh my God, no no no, this is way too complex, or or does it depend on the kind of company? Does it depend on maybe whether the company itself is a supply is a mature 
company in terms of supply chain or you know is, is that really common practice or is that you think going to become common practice no, I have to say the situation in Asia for the, the consulting uh, industry has been quite different compared to Europe or, or um, with the, the Western markets. In Asia, consulting is, uh, is not very much valuable. Uh, they, they prefer tangible, uh, practical products that you can touch. Uh, however, we've seen some kind of acceleration post-COVID uh, in the sense that uh, they started to realize that supply chain is very complex and to break it down and to make it work. So currently the question is not anymore, there's no debate on uh, um, whether they should uh, invest in their supply chain uh, capability, it's how to do it. And they realized that uh, it's not that easy in reality. So no, they are listening and they are very much interested uh, in, uh, in, in looking into uh, external reports like consultants. Okay, so you mentioned adopting different models uh, are you saying that companies need to essentially run several models at the same time and then just move the cursor up and down depending on market conditions and switch in all or part between models, keep several models uh, working at the same time, but maybe switch from one to the other at the same time partially or completely? Is that is that is really how it, how it needs to work? Multi-tier supply chain? Uh, Yes, it's a bit of everything uh, in reality because you may have, uh, depending for a given product in the same market, depending on the life cycle of this product, uh, the, the behavior, the, the consumer behavior will change. So you also need to, to change the model in reality. So you have to do that. We used to call it the life cycle management, but that's one type of, uh, of, of the models. So usually you will have um, for a given dynamic, a given um, set of, uh, again, market, maturity or uh, consumer behavior uh, versus the supply conditions, you will have a set of conditions who will define or characterize a model. And then you will have products in this, into those uh, models. So whenever a product uh, is part of it, you will uh, apply the different uh, criteria uh, to, uh, to, uh, to those products in reality. And the product can, can move in reality. If you move the, the, uh, the market, then the, the product uh, may change also in terms of uh, characterization. So that's, um, that's also something which, is, um, which has to be defined because the, the line, again, does not follow the, uh, your exact definition of a business line or a division or a brand that you may have uh, within your own organization. And for example, in, in the two different, uh, um, two different divisions, uh, I mentioned the, the cosmetics uh, uh, industry, uh, for the professional product or the, uh, the um, I would say the luxury, you may have a similar, uh, for some products, similar behavior. And this is where you need to understand that those group of products who have similar behaviors have to be grouped together and they should be, uh, if it makes sense, they should be part of a model. So in other words, to summarize it, you need to segment your supply chain by product, but also by market. Uh, and uh, according to the life cycle of the product. So you, how, how many criteria are you putting in the equation? In fact, the, the life cycle of the, the will, will drive the behavior of the product in reality. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily, uh, there are only two axes. In reality, the market, uh, 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 the, the demand pattern, let's call it this way, and the supply complexity. Is it uh, a product which is simple to manufacture, simple to distribute, or is it complex? Is it capital in intensive, for example? Uh, those uh, considerations may, may vary in reality. But a product which could be a shampoo, let's say, uh, for a shampoo today, this shampoo is a selling as part of uh, 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 one of the hot sellers. Um, in a few months, uh, the sales may uh, decrease, and in this case, the, this product will shift to another uh, model, for example. But the same product, the same shampoo, if you sell it in Italy today and you decide to sell it in Vietnam, the market, the, the two markets are very different. So the models will be also different. You may distribute Vietnam out of a manufacturing plant in France, for example, in Europe, and you ship it. 
to uh, use a distribution center to distribute it through uh, wholesalers. In Italy, it might be delivered directly uh, through uh, an e-commerce platform, for example, or uh, through uh, your, your manufacturing plants in, uh, in France. So that's why it's, um, it's not that easy, because for a given product, you may have different models in reality for the same shampoo. Right, right. Uh, we, we were running out of time, but I'd like to hear your opinion about 30 seconds on forecasting in the future. Now that all these you know, sets of data from the year 2020 will be coming into uh, feeding your APS, how, how, do, you, how do you handle uh, planning, supply chain planning in the future? Do you just erase 2020? Do you erase certain crazy behaviors of 2020? How, how are companies to uh, uh, you know, perform proper forecasting in the future? Yes, I would say 2020 has been a lesson, so you shouldn't consider whatever happened in 2020 for your forecasting exercise, don't use the, uh, this year. However, there's something quite interesting which, uh, which the dependency. So when I talk about the different, you need to identify to detect when you need to shift to a model, when if you have to shift to a, a different model. And this is instead of looking at the past, the past won't tell you anything. The past will tell you that just go ahead, just continue the way you, you you've been doing up to now because it's fine. What you need to, to do it's somehow near term. You need to identify um, that the, the patterns uh, are changing and to detect that and decide whether you should shift or not. So I think the, uh, the, the, the way we are going to forecast in, uh, in the future, and when I say in the future, in, in few months and uh, starting from 2021, would be more to consider the past and to integrate more of the, uh, the, the near future, um, especially demand sensing and also part of the artificial intelligence. More demand sensing in the future. Makes, it makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you so much for your uh, feedback on all that. Uh, I'll just want to quickly remind our audience to please vote for the start of the year. Use the comment section to find the link. Frederick, thank you so much. Uh, this was a very interesting conversation. Unfortunately, we have to go. Uh, I hope to see you again in the future. Good luck in Southeast Asia and uh, keep on giving us uh, your, your advices on, for the future.